Today, I'm speaking to Paul Dochrauer. Paul is a professor at the London School of Economics and has been a member of the Belgian Parliament. He has been an advisor at the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank and the European Commission. His research focuses on international economics and he's one of the leading experts on the political economy of the European Union. It's a pleasure. Uh, Paul de Graue and I uh, go quite a while, while back and uh, he is indeed uh, somebody I, I, I asked explicitly for advice on this uh, crazy idea of going to politics. We must be the only two people who are LSE profs and politicians uh, in these different orders. Um, so it's really, it's really great to see him again. Um, I think that Europe has gone a very, very long way in the last few weeks. Maybe not as long as somebody very ambitious like Paul would, would, like, would like to see. We will hear him out. But very far. Um, if you had asked uh, the lawyers of the Commission uh, six months ago whether the kind of program that is now on the table with 500 billion of, of loans, of grants, and 250 billion of loans uh, was possible, they probably would have started quoting articles in the treaties. And, found it impossible. The truth is um, we are seeing uh, Europe put together a very, very reasonable response. Thank you for having invited me. I'm very pleased also to be with Louis uh, back together, if I may say together. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to, to be with you. Um, despite the uh, terrible times we are living in, um, you asked me the question what my uh, forecasts are. I mean, uh, nobody can forecast in these days and, and we, we just don't know because we don't know how this virus will evolve and, and whether or not there is a second uh, wave. Um, all this is of key importance to evaluate the future, right? So I, I, I just don't know. I've seen, you must have seen the European Commission forecast that came out at the spring forecast, they were extremely optimistic. I mean, um, this was like a real V recession, right? Uh, this year, minus seven or something, right? Which is quite low, I must say. And next year, rebound of 6.7% for, I think, the Eurozone as, as a whole, which is extremely optimistic. If that is the case, then we shouldn't have a webinar. <laughs> it will it will go away by itself next year, right? Because then everything is fine again. So I'm not saying this is not possible, right? The world is full of surprises, uh, but uh, this is a really optimistic forecast. So um, I think we have to take into account a, a more pessimistic scenario that indeed uh, the, the rebound next year may not be as strong as the European Commission has forecasted. And then the question is what, what, what to do about, the, about all this, because today we are still in this deflationary spiral, right? The result of a supply and demand shock that leads to a potential spiral downwards. And, and, and we're all trying frantically to stop this. And, and up to now, most of the effort has been national, right? Budgets. The budgets are there today to, to try to stop all these dominoes falling because dominoes are falling, right? And, and the only one who's trying to support this is um, the governments, basically governments up, up to now. Now we have this very good news um, last week and, 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 and this week uh, with, with this new program uh, <clears throat> that uh, Lewis has been uh, talking about. I think this is quite a step forward. I mean, it, it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something historical, I must say, because I had no, no perspective there that this would ever happen in my lifetime. Now I have a certain age, so. <laughs> but uh, I thought, no, this is impossible. And yet there it is. Of course, we still have to wait whether the Dutch will want to give their fiat to all this, right? Because they are still uh, entangled in this morality play um, where they see themselves as the virtuous and, and the others, especially in the South, as having been sinful and therefore uh, they should uh, be punished for all this. Right? This, is, this is still a very popular um, morality play that uh, somehow makes, um, has invaded politics in, 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 in the Netherlands and a number of other countries. And happily, Germany has the German politicians have extricated themselves from this uh, 
morality play that that is really very destructive right if we all start doing this then uh, that's terrible huh? but that's the way it is so <clears throat> i think uh, we this is a major step forward but i still have the feeling that it's insufficient right because when you look at um, the, the nature of the, the collapse and, and the budget deficits that are now evolving. Now we are talking about countries having 10% budget deficit this year, right? And, and if, if next year there is no rebound, this will go on. And then the debt levels exploding. And what I'm afraid of is that after the pandemic is over, we get back into a sovereign debt crisis because some countries will have experienced higher increases in, in debt, have already high debt levels to start with. Uh, and, and, and so we have to do something about it. Now the, the ECB, well, we have done something with the, with the, the new uh, program, uh, which is um, to the 500 billion, I mean, um, um, but that's not going to be enough. Um, the ECB, of course, has committed itself to, to um, buying in the secondary market, but that doesn't really resolve the issue of exploding debts. And, and therefore, I have been proposing with a number of other economists, I'm not alone there, and that the ECB actually should do monetary financing of budget deficits that arise from um, the corona crisis, right? I know it's, it is, as is verboten, huh? the treaty says you cannot do it, but I always say, well, we have so many brilliant lawyers in Europe that can find a way out of this, uh, of this problem. Maybe I'm underestimating. Um, but uh, anyway, so I think that, that is my proposal. I think we, we, we can do it. It, 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 it can be done um, and it, it should be done um, because this is really an existential crisis and we cannot wait until um, after the, the pandemic is over, we get immediately into a new crisis, which is a sovereign debt crisis. We, and we can predict with almost certainty that this will happen, right? Uh, and we have to be prepared to, to do something about it. And I don't think we are yet prepared to do so. Look, I mean, I agree with Paul that we, we, we shouldn't try to, to forecast the future in terms of, 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 of the big uncertainties still remaining being the health uncertainties. The, the extent to which the pandemic um, provides protection to you once the virus has hit you, whether you're protected from contagion or not, is unknown. We don't know if, if that protection lasts for three months or lasts for six months or lasts for three years or forever. Um, we don't know how the antibodies work. Here. And we also don't know how long the vaccine is going to take. Mm -hmm. What that means is that there is going to be a very uh, big range of outcomes, and that's why we think in terms of of different uh, possible scenarios, um, in which in some scenarios uh, we can see a V-shaped rebound, like Paul was saying, if we basically had a vaccine that was working in September, October, then people would, would just, you know, we wouldn't have a second uh, wave and we would basically see a very good 2021. If on the other hand, um, the protection is weak, the pandemic continues, very few people seem to be infected, only 5% in, in places which are hard hit like Belgium or Spain, then we are likely to, to see still a very big, uh, a very big uh, economic hit over the next few months. So there's a big range of uncertainty coming from the epidemiology. And coming from the economics, we already know one thing which is important. To the extent that the virus is going to continue, if you think for those of you who are econ people, you think of the capital labor ratios, the capital labor substitution. Um, capital continues to be very cheap. Uh, interest rates are very low. People will want to invest in machines, in artificial intelligence, in uh, IT, etc. Labor costs are going to substantially increase. Uh, machines don't get sick. Workers get sick. Workers need to be socially separated from each other. They, they need more space. They need more... Um, measures, tests, precautions, etc. So one thing that is very likely to the extent that this pandemic continues hovering around is that we would see continuation of the trends that we have seen in the past towards relatively, uh, to, towards an increasing in substitution of labor for by capital, an increasing IT, uh, routine jobs being eliminated, people kind of mm, 
relatively high, I was going to say, levels of, of structural unemployment potentially. Uh, and increasing inequality between the people who can work from their from their homes and people who can't and potentially will be replaced. Um, if we were seeing already the replacement of supermarket cashiers in many countries by self-checking machines, it's to be expected that since the supermarket cashier is the person who's getting directly uh, in the in the in the way of the virus, mm -hmm. that we would see an acceleration of the trend towards eliminating them and putting machines. And that's something that I would expect to see uh, happening in many sectors of activity. And as a result, I would imagine that uh, automatization and substitution of routine jobs would continue to would accelerate, and that you would see an increase in wage inequality, and etc. Those things uh, suggest that in terms of aggregate demand and excess savings the trends that we have seen over the next, last uh, years are likely to continue. Uh, relatively weak demand, relatively high levels of debt, uh, relatively big inequality, relatively low levels of consumption. Um, these are structural trends that are probably accelerated by, by the presence of the pandemia. To the extent that the pandemia rebounds in a, in a V, then, and the pandemia goes away and we just get rid of it, then those things wouldn't wouldn't happen. But any in between situation where the pandemic is still around, I would expect those 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 things. Yeah, what have we learned? It, it's certainly a very different crisis than the the crisis that we experienced, the financial crisis that we experienced um, ten ten years ago, a little more than ten years ago, which was typically something endogenous, right? I mean. A boom. Capitalism is about booms and bursts, right? About periods of optimism that lead to excesses in financial markets and bubbles, and then crashes and and then unraveling and 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 governments that have to step in and and regulate and and all that. So that was the story of uh, ten years ago. Now we are faced with something quite different that maybe happens every hundred years or something. I don't know. Um, this, this kind of ex really exogenous shock, right? if there's something that you can call an exogenous shock, it, it's that. Of course, in, in, in globalization, we also make these shocks easier to be transmitted. Huh? That, that is also true. Um, but, but we have seen that in history, yeah? these kind of pandemics and even much worse than what we have today. So uh, I think up to now, I must say the reaction of the most authorities, not all, but has, has been right in the sense of identifying a problem of, of capitalism is that in normal times, it's a great system, right? But when it is shocked, shocked like this, it can become unstable, right? Um, if you let it go, it may really go to a totally different equilibrium, unraveling, right? And we need an external um, authority to stop this from going to a bad, a real bad equilibrium. Suppose we had done nothing with the budget, right? Suppose we had followed the rules that existed in the past in the European Union, balanced budgets, right? Clearly, this would have been a disaster, right? We would quickly have found a new terrible bad equilibrium. And happily, we understood, and most people understood, no, you cannot do that. The system is not, um, cannot support this kind of shocks, and, and we, have to, we have to sustain it, right? And, and, and most countries did it, right? So, and that, that was something positive. Uh, and the issue, of course, is the governments that have done this, are they strong enough now? Because they will have to issue debt, huh? and they are massively issuing debt. And what's going to happen afterwards with, with all that debt? How are we going to deal with this? That's why I'm, I'm in favor of monetary financing. It's a way to, to get rid of large parts of the debt, right? And you create, in the future, you will have a little more inflation, right? Uh, after when the pandemic is over, there will be more inflation. Not now, because everything is in a deflationary spiral. But in the future, this will lead to some, some inflation. I would say, great. I mean... Um, it's like rain, it's a, we have droughts now in many countries, 
and you, we need rain, right? And, and inflation is the kind of rain that we may need uh, once the recovery is there. But we are still too much um, gripped by dogmas, right? Uh, it's, it's still a dogma in many countries. This is devilish. Um, and, and, and immediately you, you are told, when I propose that, I'm told, oh, this will lead to hyperinflation. Of course not. I mean, you can, this, everybody knows that it is a one shot affair, right? This is a temporary, this is a temporary thing. We don't know how long it will last, but this is a temporary thing. And we should use all instruments that we have available, right, to, to deal with this. And we should not say, oh, but we have tied our hands um, and uh, it's not allowed to do monetary financing. And even if we go under, we will not untie our hands. That doesn't seem to me to be rational, right? Uh, we should certainly untie our hands under those conditions. And we can do that. But um, I, I don't predict that this will happen because the dogmas are stronger in this particular case. So we will have to muddle through in different ways. But I, I, I like uh, Lewis' analysis of the substitution between capital and, and labor, which um, is going on as a trend but may now be accelerating. And, and all this, of course, will also depend on how long this pandemic lasts. Uh, Paul, um, I, I wanted to ask you a question on this. Uh, it's really, you are, you are the expert on this, on this topic. And you, I mean, I have to tell people that Paul was the person in the world, not just in, in LSC, who first realized uh, that the crisis of the Eurozone had all the features of the sovereign debt crisis, that in fact what happened in the Eurozone was exactly like what happened in a country that had indebted itself in a foreign currency, and thus the, the cycle of destabilizing exits of capital, higher interest rates, more likelihood, more fear by people of a, a currency uh, exit, of an exit from the fixed change rate from the euro, and accelerating uh, debt crisis. Um, so, Paul, uh, let me play devil's advocate here. You're saying, well, there's no fear of uh, hyperinflation. It's kind of, we shouldn't worry. It's one of. So let's just play it with, with the U.S., okay? So in the U.S., imagine that, you know, the federal, the, the, the balance sheet has grown, like, from a few hundred billion to a few trillion during the crisis, previous crisis. Now it's few, from a few trillion to maybe 10 trillion, which are really large numbers. And the question is, if inflation starts to creep up, the, Europe, the, the, the Federal Reserve, we would need to believe that the Federal Reserve is going to increase interest rates, which would badly destabilize the financial system, badly destabilize or increase the cost of, of borrowing for the US government. My question would be, wouldn't, be the, wouldn't the crisis of pain of the financial system that has grown addicted to the drug of very low interest rates and it's always rolling over debt and it's always kind of uh, benefiting from this, from this uh, put, right, from this, from the fact that the, the bank will always come uh, to save it, the Federal Reserve. Put in the crisis of pain from the financial system and from the U.S. government, stop this from happening, these interest rates increases from happening, and wouldn't we end up in a situation where the credibility of the Federal Reserve was gone and where essentially inflation expectations were running out of control. Are, are you not at all concerned about this scenario? And do you think that even if debt accumulates, and even if the financial system continues growing uh, uh, instability, etc., cetera, you, you don't think that we would see uh, the anchoring of expectations, to put it in more technical terms? Of course, you, you contrast the U.S. very much with the ECB, right? And the U.S. has been, gone much farther in... In, in doing all this, right? It's, it's in doing monetary financing, it's taking over private debt at an accelerated pace, and um, it has gone much farther than the ECB has been going up to now. So one, one could have more uh, fear of inflation in the US than in, in, and in, and in Europe and in the Eurozone. I, mean, I don't think in the Eurozone we have gone that far so that we should actually fear this kind of uncontrolled inflation. Huh? So that, that, that's the key point. I mean, um, if, if you start doing this, can that lead to something unstable? Because uh, it leads to 
uh, higher interest rates and, and, and you know, to offset all this, the, the, the central bank has to increase even more the money stock and you get, it gets out of control. Yeah, of course, if you, if you do too much, that is always a danger, huh? but I don't think that danger exists in Europe. I mean, the ECB has not done that. Um, I've, I've done myself some calculations uh, using the quantity theory of money, right? The old quantity theory of money. Uh, the economist among you still remember um, there is a proportional relationship between the price level and the money stock given output and velocity, right? Um, so I've been looking at the numbers that we have in, in the Eurozone. And um, if, so what I'm doing is if the ECB were to finance the budget deficits that are the result of Corona, today, right, or in 2020, right? This would amount to an increase in the money stock of close to 1,000 billion. Money stock, not money base, right? Given the money multiplier and all that. And if you feed it then up in, into, this leads to uh, an increase in the price level of something like 20%, price level increase of about 20%. Using the quantity of saying, well, once we are back, in, in, in equilibrium after the pandemic, right, and output has recovered, the overhang of liquidity that we have here will in, at some point, or risks at some point to add about 20% to the price level. Now, this will not happen in just one year. This is likely to be spread over several years so that if the ECB were to do this monetary financing, one can expect after the crisis a number of years um, of four or five percent inflation, right? Pretty much lower than what we had in the 70s. And I'm confident that the ECB being um, the most independent central bank um, in, in the world, right? In the sense that no government can dictate the ECB anything compared to Britain, where the government can tell the Bank of England what to do, right? Um, that the ECB will not be caught into a situation where it will have to repeat that all the time, right? Of course, interest rates will increase, yeah. Uh, but inflation also, and the real interest rates may actually not increase. So from that point of view, I'm relatively confident that, uh, yes, this will in the end lead to somewhat more inflation, but we can contain it and, and we should not, uh, at least I'm talking about Europe, right? In the US, I don't want to say anything about this. Um, we, we can do it. But I, I see here this question about, uh, the, 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 is it going to change um, the, uh, the, the, the paradigm in which we have been living, right? The, the neoliberal, neoliberal approach that has dominated EU policies over the past decades. Will, will that change, right? Uh, um, of course, everything is difficult to predict, but it's clear that we are shaking up the paradigm, right? Uh, uh, remember the paradigm was, well, one aspect of the paradigm was, um, we have to be competitive, social spending is unproductive, we have, to, we have to do austerity, reduce all this, right? And, and famous economists came out and saying that if you reduce spending, right, um, that, is, that is good, but you shouldn't increase taxes because spending is somehow, uh, social spending in particular, is unproductive. Now, that idea has gone down the drain, right? Uh, we now learn that um, a strong social security system is, is like an investment that we made, right? We made an investment in the past that now has a high return when you compare what happens in many European countries to what happens in Anglo-Saxon countries where there's no social security. One must say that, Jesus, this social spending was, was a great investment that now bears fruit. And, and we have to rethink all this, right? Um, and and I'm, I'm also quite interested, you may have seen this poll um, that was published today of UK economists, right? But the change in view, the, uh, the question was asked uh, after the pandemic, when we will have to bring down um, budget deficits, should we cut spending? Not a single UK economist said we should cut spending. 
if there is a need to reduce the deficit, it will have to be through increases in taxes. That's really quite a change in the paradigm because up to now we are told exactly the opposite. All the programs that the European Commission and the Troika was organizing for countries in the South after the sovereign debt crisis had this thing, you have to do austerity, but wait a minute, no increases in taxes, it had to be reductions in spending. So that's finished, I hope. Um, so that is certainly something that is going to be something that we have to rethink right, in terms of our policy making. Um, I think uh, Paul is right that the consensus uh, has shifted, uh, both because of the origin of the crisis, uh, it's not just because countries were in debt. I think he made a very good point about uh, proving that an investment in strong social safety net has actual economic returns, not just social and health returns, but actual economic returns. That if your country has people who are has enough beds, intensive care beds, as simple as that, your health system doesn't collapse and you don't need as much of a lockdown. So um, I think people understand that. Um, I think it doesn't stop you from wanting to have an efficient uh, state. I think austerity is a consequence of a debt crisis. And if, if, we, if we see, as, as Paul was fearing in his first response, a return of the sovereign debt crisis because we don't do our homework, then it will be inevitable for countries to go into all sorts of cuts. Our challenge is to avoid that. Our challenge is to find ways to uh, insure countries against the effects of this, the economic effects of this pandemic, and in, in, and in so doing, ensure that that path is not taken, that they don't need to take the path of fast aid. <laughs>